this week on the Back Table Podcast. And so it took three or four times where I'd make a couple of passes under ice and just be like, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to do it under sure. CO2. Um, and I think that, you know, once I committed to myself that I was going to learn it, I said, I'm going to do at least 10 in a row that use ice. I'm just going to say, you know, I'm going to do 10. And after about the fourth one, I got very, very comfortable using it to the point now where, you know, do I use it every time? No, because I want my fellows to learn otherwise. But, you know, there, there are certain situations where without it, I would have done many more sticks that just were never going to work in terms of angle or in terms of just anterior posterior. And, you know, the some of the little things in terms of being able to find certain veins that we'll end up talking about has really, really helped because you just once you get a picture with the ice, you just know what tips you need to put in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and minimally invasive. If you are a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all the previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, which is backtable.com. Very easy to remember. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, let us know how we can make this podcast a more valuable resource for the IR and endovascular community. Market declines, unemployment, the COVID-19 pandemic. Don't let headlines derail your long-term financial strategy. This Backtable episode is brought to you by Yafi Tedessa, Edward Jones Financial Advisor in Dallas, Texas. He'll work for you to help you understand the impact of short-term events and how to prepare for the long-term. Learn how he can help you reach your financial goals. Visit edwardjones.com slash Yafi Tedessa or a little bit easier to remember is backtable.com slash 401k for more information. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Mike, do you have a financial advisor? Nope. Why not? I don't know, man. You know, I've been trying my best to do it on my own. But no, I mean, it's an important question. I started my current job and uh, they, you know, they didn't have a 401k that started for my first year. It was like, so I wanted to, to meet my contributions for that year and I didn't know how. So I didn't. Yeah. How long do you think you're going to do it on your own for? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I just had my third kid, Aaron. And uh, <laughs> well, there you, know, you go. All this, yeah. all this free time that I thought I had, which is already very slim, uh, is gone. So I, I am reaching the point where I want to make sure that I'm checking all my boxes and that I'm not, I'm not getting behind on any of this stuff. Yeah. Well, if you if you want to, I would tune in uh, to this uh, webinar that Yafi is going to do on uh, retirement plans and tax savings. And uh, the easiest way to, to sign up for it is to go to backtable.com slash 401k. The information will be on the website or on that page. So go ahead and sign up. Okay, I'll do it. All right. So we have today Dr. Emmett Linsky. We're going to be talking about advanced tips techniques there's three things that I really want to talk about. There's uh, uh, the ice or, you know, intracardiac uh, echo, um, the gun sight technique and splenic access. You got any preference as to what you want to jump into first? Uh, I'm happy with any. Why don't we, uh, why don't we start out with uh, intracardiac echo? Because that's kind of like a, a good transition uh, between the uh, sophomore, junior year. And, uh, you know, we can go from there. I mean, I think that when I look at the last 10 years of doing this, I think one of the things that has made tips safer, uh, a little bit easier, to be honest, and to be fair, a little bit faster uh, for a couple of different reasons is the intracardiac echo. Uh, there is a learning curve uh, associated with doing it. And you know, I think back to my fellowship and when we were getting uh, arterial access in the leg, you know, one of our older attendings kept saying, you know what, like no interventional radiologist and who's worth his salt would ever use ultrasound to access the, you know, the femoral artery. Like, sure. it's just, and I think that in five or six years, that's what we're going to be, uh, we're, you know, and a lot of people say that about ice, like, oh, you know, every interventional radiologist really should know how to do a TIPS without ice. And I think that that's true right now, but as that becomes, as ice becomes more and more available, uh, I think that we will question why we didn't adopt it sooner, much like uh, ultrasound 
uh, okay. in Goin. Take us back to when you first, like it first became on your radar and um, how you got wind of it. And then like talk about like overcoming that learning curve early on, because I think like some people have dabbled in it and they're like, oh, this is a huge pain in the ass. I already know how to do a tips. And so they they can abandon it a little bit early. Um, so what made you like persevere and what were some of the like the big unlocks um, that made like ice from like this nuanced little device to something that now like you use routinely? Yeah, so I think that's that's a good point. And when I was kind of reading, you know, going through the literature, reading JBIR, I saw that some people were using it, and there were some good articles about how it lowered radiation dose, uh, how it lowered number of passes, and how it lowered time. Um, I think at that point, when that was starting to come out, I already felt like there probably wasn't a device that was going to help me in those situations. You know, if you're you know, fluoro time is under five minutes and you're doing one to two passes, you know, you're going to wonder why you need to have a $1,200 catheter. But at the same time, I was doing enough complex tips where I felt like it would be a useful adjunct. Uh, and so I thought about, you know what, let me just bring it in on some just completely routine cases. So a case where I know, you know, based upon the MRI that that portal vein was nice and plump, I just wanted to see, you know, what it was about, uh, what it let me do, uh, and, and you know, could could I actually work it? Um, you know, part of it was that uh, you know I'm in a training institution, and we wanted to be able to at least have that as an available tool to have for the fellows. Um, and so there was a little bit of a push to have an ultrasound machine that was um, able to. Um, handle the probe uh, okay. because you know you have to have a special ultrasound machine and then um, it was a little bit about just overcoming the fear of it right you know and overcoming um, the uncertainty and so you know that for me where I ran into problems early on um, was just kind of understanding you know how the fluoroscopic images correlated with the uh, ice images uh, and I just couldn't couldn't really figure it out. And so it took three or four times where I'd make a couple of passes under ice and just be like, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to do it under sure. CO2. Um, and I think that, you know, once I committed to myself that I was going to learn it, I said, I'm going to do at least 10 in a row that use ice. I'm just going to say, you know, I'm going to do 10. And after about the fourth one, I got very, very comfortable using it to the point now where, you know, do I use it every time? No, because I want my fellows to learn otherwise. But you know, there there are certain situations where without it, uh, I would have done many more sticks that just were never going to work in terms of angle or in terms of just anterior posterior. And you know, the some of the little things in terms of being able to find certain veins that we'll end up talking about has really really helped because you just once you get a picture with the ice, you just know what tips you need to put in. Okay. So there are a couple of things that I wanted to unpack. One, um, are you telling me that like a routine tips, you're, you're doing it, it with under five minutes of fluoroscopy? Like, I think I heard that. Uh, if it's, a, you know, it, it's going to be based upon the, uh, the MRI, but if, if it's like an MRI and you know, there's no training involved, yeah, we can, it's pretty reasonable to do it. Let's say under 10 minutes of fluoro time. Uh, good. you know, pretty, you know, pretty routinely. And then, you know, you can, you know, if you're, if everything goes right, you, you can get it under five. Man, it's pretty good. All right. So some other things that I want to talk about is whenever you do, uh, or, or using the, uh, ice probe, um, do you use it from a jugular approach? Do you use it from a femoral approach? And what kind of view does it give you for, for the uninitiated? I mean, in, in all, all I know is that like from what I've read on papers, it's like a 90 degree view, like similar to what you would see with a conventional ultrasound probe. It's not like, a, um, you know, an IVIS probe. Right. And so, you know, that I think that everyone will kind of do it. If you're a sole operator, most people are going to go from the neck just because you can then you know, make your throw and control the ultrasound probe. Uh, from the same site. I almost always have a fellow, so I go from the femoral approach. I come up, um, the ice is side looking, so you have a conventional picture uh, that you would have. It's a side looking 90 degree picture. At the top of your screen is going to be the hepatic vein, and then lower down on the screen. So, kind of 
you know, the, at least the way I have it set up, you know, at the in the left side of the screen, um, is you know my hepatic vein. The right side of the screen is the inferior, the portal vein, and then you know you just end up torquing. You know, the the ice probe is designed for intracardiac echo, so it has a high degree of flexibility, and it can be torqued anterior, posterior, uh, left, right. So it has almost a full 360 degree ability to turn. I don't use any of those controls. I okay. simply ro rotate the probe. Uh, gotcha. So, you know, I, I almost spin it. So I don't adjust the, uh, the uh, anterior, posterior, uh, left, right uh, on that at all. And the way I found it most helpful is that when I'm going up, and, you know, go, ours goes through an eight French sheath, I'll go up and I will find the main portal vein uh, first, and I will follow the main portal vein out to the right, just so I can kind of get a sense of what the right portal vein, and then I will follow it to the left so I know where the bifurcation is. So that's just kind of a fact-finding mission for me, even before I go down from the neck, even get jugular access. Okay. Um, I'm just kind of getting the lay of the land. One of the things that I had learned in previously doing tips without ice is that you can be relatively certain which hepatic vein you are accessing, but you're never 100% certain, right? And even some of the research studies that have been done, you know, not, they weren't great, but, you know, anecdotally, if you looked at it and you looked at some of these studies, you could only be about 50% certain that you were actually in the vein you thought you were in. Um, and, you know, as a result, if you thought you were in the right, you, in the, you were in the middle, you're doing anterior, posterior throws, and so you're never really certain. And so one of the things that I really liked about the ice is that as I rotate the catheter and I can define what the left, what the middle, and what the right is, is that then I can be 100% sure when I'm selecting the hepatic vein that I'm actually in the one that I intended to be in. And so I watch my catheter go down into the right hepatic vein. If I need to switch to the middle, I can direct my catheter into the middle have hepatic vein under ice or even the left. And I think that we all know that sometimes the middle and the left hepatic vein can be a little bit tricky to get into and a, a little bit difficult to define in geographically just because most of the time that origin is coming directly anterior. Um, and you know, then that middle hepatic vein will run anterior and then cut over to the right and it can kind of trick you a little bit. Um, and, you know, I know for me with fellows, it's been a little difficult as they're kind of pulling their catheter back to select the hepatic vein. I'm never really certain whether or not they're torquing it or something. So um, the ice catheter takes that question away. So, so those, that's kind oh, of, the, yeah, go ahead. So, so I wanted to jump in. So, so actually catheterizing the hepatic vein, you found ice to be very, very helpful. Are you actually catheterizing are, are you basically catheterizing a vessel and checking with ice, or do you actually use the probe to like capture the uh, to capture the vessel live time? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when it's the right, I just do it and then check. Okay. Uh, when it's the middle, I will often use the ice uh, to watch it go in or to guide it. So I will you know pull it back fluoroscopically. I will then find my catheter under ice and I'll just pull it back under ice and then select. And then that way I'll watch my wire go into the, into the vein that I intended to go into. Nice. And as far as um, the, the probe manipulation for this section, do you basically have to have someone working the probe for you and like, and, and just making like small adjustments as, as you're um, either uh, evaluating the hepatic veins for catheterization or is it more of a situation where you can just kind of park it and you can find a location where you're able to see what you need to see and then do a little work and come back to it? For a standard tips where I'm going to go right to right, I do not need someone to manipulate it real time for me. Okay. So I will go, I will find the, the picture that I like, um, and then I will go back to the, the neck or I'll just reach across the leg and adjust it on the fly. I think that you know when I am getting things set up, the before and again I was kind of alluded to this earlier is when before I even get jugular access, I've already decided what kind of tips I'm going to put in, and I used to do that from my MRI, and I would look at the relationship of the portal vein and the hepatic vein to each other. Now the second step that I do is I also look at the ice, and so I will go to the right hepatic vein. 
And really what I want to see on that ice picture is that the hepatic vein and the portal branch, which I'm intending to hit, are in the same plane. Uh, and what that means is that I do not need to torque my catheter anterior, right, to see the branch that I'm trying to get into. Because one of the things that we talked about earlier and one of the things that I've further seen on ice is that as much as I believe that I can get a very good anterior throw from a right uh, hepatic vein into a right portal vein, you are not able to get as anterior as you think. And realistically, it is more of a you know, downward straight shot from your hepatic vein into your portal vein branch. And so if you see your hepatic vein, which looks very linear on the ice and your portal vein, which looks like a very nice circle. If you see those two in the same picture, then you're going to be able to access that vein. And if you do not see those two on the same picture, then it will be very difficult to you know, adjust yourself out of plane in order to get into the portal vein branch they're looking at. And so if I do not see a really nice branch to hit from the right, I will switch to the middle. And invariably, you will find that a middle to right or a middle to left will be there if the other isn't. And then similarly, if you don't see it from there, I've even gone from left to left or left um, to right uh, as needed from, uh, you know, a, you know, because you, you're basically coming down onto the main portal at that oh, okay. point from the left. Say, I was like, so left very right. central. Wow. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, from that standpoint, you can you can find the picture you need in order to hit the branch you need, and I think that that's very important because if I'm doing a uh, complex or a thrombosed portal vein, if I can see the thrombosed portal branch, then I can stick it under ice. Uh, and so, you know, th those are the sorts of techniques we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, but that's the sort of evaluation I'm doing before I'm even getting jugular access, okay. um, because then I'll know. All right. So at this point, like, let's say that you, you, you've used ice to select like a middle hepatic vein and you found like an in-plane portal vein with your hepatic vein. And, and what you're saying, and, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a, a thousand words, but basically you can splay out the hepatic vein, but then for the portal vein, you'll see just a circle, like you're, catch, you're catching it in cross section. That is exactly right. Okay. And the, because you're ice catheter is in the IVC, the closer the portal vein is to your catheter, right, to, to you know, the, the anterior part of the image is the more vertical or more medial type of throw you're going to get. Okay. The further away, right, because, you know, you're just getting, this is at this point distance from the IVC, right, right so right, the right. deeper the vein is, the more lateral your throw is going to be. Gotcha. And so as you torque your needle, you are becoming less and less lateral because when you torque your tips needle, you're actually coming more and more medial with your throw. And so that's kind of how you end up. And that was one of the, the biggest learning curves for me is understanding the more I torque my needle, the more vertical the needle becomes uh, with respect to uh, – the, the IVC, it starts to parallel the IVC. Okay. And so the less you torque your needle, the more it's going to fall lateral and go lateral within the liver. And so that's the degree of torque decides, you know, where along that portal branch, you're going to end up hitting and, you know, adjusting your torque real time is one of the nice things, because even within the parenchyma, you can adjust enough to be able to hit that branch that you want to hit. Yeah, so that was actually my next question. So when you're actually making throws under or, or using the ice probe, um, you're able to basically select the section of the hepatic vein that you want to enter, uh, determine the amount of torque. And and I think if I can recap it, the more torque you place on it, the more medial your throw is going to be, the less torque, you know, you're going to have a more peripheral lateral throw. Um, but you're able to adjust real time and... Like, I mean, are, are you like hitting it on the button or is it like, you know, you put yourself in the ballpark, then check under fluoro? So you'll hit it on the button. So nice. you, you know, at over time, you can get to the point where on occasion, uh, I will see that I'm in and sometimes your needle will get clogged. Uh, but I will see that my needle tip is in the portal vein and I'm not getting blood back and I'll just send my wire and be in. Uh, 
and I've used that for thrombosed portal veins uh, to, to access them without kind of cleaning up. As long as you know you're in the clot, you can see you wouldn't get blood back. Um, you can do that. But I still will aspirate back, get blood and puff just to confirm that I'm in. Uh, but invariably, the, the ice catheter doesn't really lie. Uh, and if you are not bisecting your circle with your needle and you were a little dishonest with yourself about how good your throw was, invariably you're not going to be in. Yeah. Okay. So just like regular ultrasound, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So about how many, how many times uh, with using the um, ice catheter until you felt like this was becoming something that you weren't just kind of working on and was, you know, an adjunct to what you were doing to, to where it, it became something that you leaned on or like an essential troubleshooting tool. Like, like what's the number of cases like you think, you know, I'm sure everyone's different, but what's like roughly the number of cases before like you kind of uh, came over the hill with that learning curve? Right. I would say about the, the third or fourth case, I was very comfortable with how I was going to torque the probe and how I was going to hit the vein. So like the, just the technical aspects, I got over very quickly about three or four cases. Using it as a indispensable adjunct tool, like, you know, seeing and troubleshooting before I have even made a pass. So realizing before I've made a right to right pass that it was never going to work uh, and going middle to right kind of preemptively, that happened about kind of the ninth or 10th case. So, you know, as I, you know, would go and I would learn kind of the relationships of the portal vein to the hepatic vein and realize that, you know what, I'm going to have to do a U-turn just to get back up to the main portal vein if I'm hitting a very, very inferior right. Uh, and then just moving on and looking to do a middle to right where I won't have that U-turn in my tips. Uh, those sorts of things happened about nine or 10. Uh, and I think that I became much more comfortable abandoning a bad stick um, once I had that. And that's something that, you know, early on, I had always been taught, you you know, once you hit the portal vein, you never abandon that stick. Right. And that's, now that's the conventional wisdom, right? You can make anything right. into a tips. Right. Uh, and now either I won't make the throw or if I'm really unhappy with it, I'm, I'm okay with abandoning that. Um, and I think that that's kind of a, it's a nice luxury to have because a couple of tips that I've done kind of in the past where, you know, it was one of those U-turn tips uh, and I, you know, got a vein I didn't really like, you know, I ended up either placing a parallel tips later on or the tips ended up thrombosing or something like that. So I just feel like that that doesn't happen now. That's great. Is there, is, is it worth mentioning like the cost of the ice probe? Like, did you get any pushback from hospital admin or it was already in your system? The cardiologists were using it, so they really didn't care because I, I assume that like the probe is, is it, a, is it a disposable probe? So it's a, you know, it's a disposable probe uh, and our institution reconditions them. So uh, there is a program that, you know, you use the probe, you know, you send it away they recondition it and they send it back. And so that brings the cost down. I think for us, roughly I've been told from $1,200 to $800 per probe. Um, so it's not cheap. Gotcha. Um, and cert certainly if I were, uh, you know, bearing the cost of the probes myself, I wouldn't use it nearly as much. Um, but at the same time, uh, now that I necessarily don't necessarily bear the cost of the probe, um, you know, I think it's faster. And to be fair, um, you know, if you consider room time, uh, right, a, right. you know, something that it has intrinsic value, uh, if you're out of the room or you're doing your tips routinely an hour, hour and 15 minutes with this, then, you know, your four hour anesthesia block becomes a two hour anesthesia block or a two and a half. And I think that we have seen that uh, where across the board, not just me, but my partners, now that we use this more often, you know, the, the overall time that any tips is booked for and any tips takes is significantly lower. Yeah. I think that's the ultimate, uh, like, you know, when people discuss like radiation number of passes, I mean, I think some of those things resonate, but when you tell someone you can cut the time of your, you know, tips procedure, um, I think that, uh, really makes a difference. The, the second most important place that I find ice uh, to be helpful is not so much in the portal vein thrombosis unless it's hyperacute, right? Like if it's hyperacute and you have this really plump 
expanded portal vein, it's great. When it is chronically thrombosed, doesn't really help a whole lot, to be perfectly honest, uh, other than to find wires after you recant. Where I found ice to be really helpful is in tips revisions. Okay. Uh, and, you know, one of the problems is there is a certain sub subset of tips thromboses that um, either I was having to go transabdominal and directly stick the tips or transplenic and go retrograde. And the ice catheter allows me to be very, very confident in that I'm engaging the thrombosed cap of the tips with my catheter. And it allows me to use a little bit more force and it allows me to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of driving through that cap to the point where since I've started using ice, I haven't really needed to directly stick the tips uh, or go... Um, transplenic to uh, retrograde recanna tips uh, since then. Um, and part of it is when you are on that cap, then you feel a little bit more comfortable using the back end of wire to pop through the cap. Uh, or if you're on that cap uh, and you're certain that you are engaged in the clot, you're a you can be a little bit more aggressive with your wire. Uh, and the ice lets you physically see that you are sitting directly on top of the tips, whereas fluoroscopically, you might be pretty certain, but not entirely sure. And you weren't sure if you're kind of jumping off the cap or sliding off in the, you know, in those instances in which I've had a little bit of trouble, you know, adding that uh, has allowed me to, for example, use a transjugular uh, cannula to engage it and then just use the back end of my wire uh, with a nice, you know, stiff metal cannula to just pop in. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I'm not having to directly stick the abdomen. And if I'm needing to use TPA, then I haven't put a hole in the liver capsule. And, it, you know, it just frees me up to be, you know, to have more tools later on. So the visualization you get with uh, the ice catheter, I imagine, is pretty good if you're trying to visualize like the metallic um, uh, covered end of the stent and you're already able to get a very nice look at the hepatic vein. So it's, it, 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 you know, I apologize for, you know, just not having the visual, but um, whenever you're on it, it's very clear that you're on it. Like, um, like, and you can tell like where you are within the struts or you can just you tell can, that you like, you have it zeroed in. You can see that you are zeroed in because it is so fine in that anterior posterior direction. When you are seeing the tips catheter, you can actually see the thrombus sitting on top of the tips uh, and you know, kind of almost like a rounded mound uh, that is keeping your wire from being able to engage in. And because that end of the tips is covered, you can feel pretty confident that as long as you're engaged through that cap of the clot that you're kind of getting down and all the way through. Uh, and then, you know, once you're engaged in, then, you know, it just gives you that certainty that you can be a little bit more aggressive with your push and you're not going to be hurting the liver and you're going to be certain that you are kind of getting through uh, into the tips without uh, having to kind of go through the the liver parenchyma or you know through a solid organ. Sure. So whenever you um, whenever you're doing a tips revision, do you always pull the ice, or is it again like you're using it as a troubleshooting catheter once you can engage? So with the tips revision, I will only pull it when I'm having a lot of trouble getting in. So okay. I will try every other tool up my sleeve short of either sticking the tips itself or sticking the spleen. So if I'm getting to the point where I need to use an adjunct tool, this is my first step rather than kind of going uh, transabdominal, which used to be my first step. Gotcha. Because um, my, I, I guess my line of questioning was, is, is it in some cases, whenever you're not able to engage, is it the fact that, like on the like, I didn't know if maybe you could see it with the ice catheter that it's like a rounded thrombus on top of the the uh, graft, which keeps you from engaging. And and maybe sometimes like whenever it's a little bit easier to get into, like it might be like concave. But I guess if you're not seeing the ones you don't troubleshoot, it's hard to know. Right, and you know, it's it's more the ones that are chronically thrombosed that you didn't know. Right, someone okay. had a six months follow up and you know, they had a thrombose tips on the a follow up ultrasound and you don't you know, it might have been out for three, three and a half months. I and see. So that cap has gotten hard. 
And, you know, the other thing is when you are trying to find a middle hepatic vein that you have used for a TIPS and, you know, just finding the origin of that vein sometimes can be very, very difficult. Uh, and having the ice in those instances uh, can be helpful. Um, and, you know, to be fair with fellows, it's nice to pull out because then they get practice in a kind of non urgent setting where it's just a matter of kind of learning the catheter and it's a it's a good reason uh, to pull it out uh, and so my threshold isn't super high to do it but uh, you know if I'm just doing a routine uh, patient who thrombosed last week I I probably won't bring it out it's, it's gotcha. more for the chronic clot okay that's fair all right any other uh, good uses um, for the ice catheter or uh, ones that we haven't haven't mentioned when I'm doing my dual run with my pigtail catheter and uh, my sheath, I will lay the ice catheter uh, directly on the hepatic vein origin. And so what I'll do is I'll drive the ice catheter up. And this is the one instance in which I will use the anterior posterior uh, torquing tool. And I will actually torque the ultrasound probe so it is literally laying on the origin of the hepatic vein. Uh, as it comes into the IVC. Okay. And so then when I do my dual run, I know exactly where the top of the tips needs to sit. Um, and I feel that it's because I've already done this with my portal access, I can get a very, very accurate measurement of my tract um, when I'm doing my measurement. And then fast forward to when I'm actually deploying the tips, uh, one of the really nice things is that when you have your sheath deep into the portal vein and you deploy the uncovered end of your stent, you can actively watch the ring and the uncovered portion of the stent pull back in your portal vein until it is actually sitting where you hit the portal vein under ultrasound. Uh, and then you can watch your stent actually kind of catch right where it went. So if you know you weren't entirely certain, you know, where the uncovered portion mm -hmm. was within the liver because fluoroscopically it could be anterior or posterior, I think that the ice gives you that ability to actually make sure that that ring is seated right at the uh portal vein access site. Uh and that's been a, a nice tool to to make sure that, you know, your, your tips isn't sitting too deep or that you have actually pulled it back enough uh, so that it's kind of seated correctly in the track and it's not sitting too far forward. What is the what does the ring look like? Is it just like where you see like a compressed section? It, you just see the transition point of the the stent? Like what does it look like under ultrasound is like what I'm trying to imagine. Like I can't imagine, you. do you actually see the ring? So what you see is you see the very, very echogenic uh, compression kind of compressed tips catheter or sheath and then you see it splay out kind of like a cone mm -hmm. and you can actually see the individual interstices of the stent uh, under ultrasound and so it's kind of like this round tube that then kind of tapers down into a cone and that is the transition where you have not you know deployed the the covered portion of your stent and so you're pulling that cone into the liver parenchyma and you can see exactly where the transition is between the liver parenchyma and the portal vein and you can ensure that that uncovered portion of your stent is sitting exactly at the point where your stick was in the portal vein. All right, very interesting. Do you, ever, do you watch it uncovered? Does it uh, kind of look cool whenever you uh, unsheath it and pull the cord? It does. It does. Yeah. It's, it kind of is a, a really good image. And then I always check to see uh, where the tips is uh, sitting at the proximal edge. So at the, the hepatic, vein, hepatic vein, IVC confluence. Yeah, I want to see exactly where it is. And I will say that the my placements have become more accurate. Um, I will say I notoriously leave mine a little bit short. And we talked about this earlier right, because right. of the transplant surgeons because I was afraid of, you know, not, you know, leaving them too long. Now, I think almost universally, we're leaving them pretty, pretty close to flush with the IBC. Very nice. Okay. 
So now let's uh, take a, a slightly left turn and let's do splenic access. Let's talk about splenic okay. access because I feel like that's going to segue nicely into gun sight. Um, all right. So let's talk about um, for uh, for those who have either never done it or or just haven't done it very often, um, respecting the spleen. But this is definitely a, a territory that is in bounds as far as vascular access so we'll just talk about like some of the abc some of the things like you do to set yourself up for success but also uh, some technical maneuvers that make it easier right so i think the the first thing you want to think about uh when you're doing splenic access is that it does not necessarily have to be for a tips you know i'll list a couple of different reasons why i've used it and why i like it uh one is for patients with ectopic varices that are bleeding who otherwise can't undergo a TIPS. Um, I, that was kind of some of the first times I used it years and years and years ago. Uh, and it can give you a favorable angle into certain um, splenorenal shunts that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get to as easily either through a transhepatic or a transjugular access. Another uh, instance in which I've used this is some of our pediatric interventions. So pediatric portal vein stenosis large congenital shunts uh, that we've had to embolize, uh, uh, intrahepatic shunts, like very, very small kind of like sub-year-old uh, portal vein embolization. Uh, just because if you have a you know 10-pound child, your tools are too big otherwise. And so all of a sudden, if you have a, an inch or two more by going through the spleen, uh, that that's actually been very, very helpful. Uh, and then uh, obviously access to recanalize the portal vein. Yeah. Um, and so I think all of those uh, require kind of the same thought and the same evaluation. Uh, and I think that the first thing that you really want to look at uh, on your cross sectional imaging is, you know, how big is and where is the spleen located? And yeah, I think that what you're looking for when you are first evaluating access into the spleen is one is the splenic vein open uh, because that is not necessarily always the case uh, number two is is the spleen big enough to make sure that you are going to be safe in getting into the spleen without necessarily crossing the pleura or something like that if you can avoid it and then is there an anterior enough branch in the spleen that you can be comfortable working through it right so if the more anterior you are in the body accessing the spleen, the more comfortable you're going to be working. If you are having to access very, very posterior in the spleen, then your sheath is just going to be in a relatively uncomfortable working place, and you're just going to have to kind of work around it a little bit more. So for all the patients that you're evaluating for splenic access, like presumably you have some set of cross-sectional imaging that you can work off of. Is there anything that you prefer? I mean, I'm assuming contrast enhanced exam, but do you prefer like having a CT, like a contrast enhanced CT to understand some of the, the splenic venous anatomy? Or do you ever order a specific test? Yeah, go ahead. I usually don't. Yeah, I, I usually won't order a specific test. I'll take whatever I have. MRI or a CT um, is, is equally as good. Um, okay. And I think that more, you know, the more I've done it, the when I'm actually getting down to brass tacks, it's a lot about my ultrasound evaluation of the of the spleen. And, you know, everyone is a little bit different. I tend to access, you know, I'll, I'll hold my probe, uh, you know, parallel to the, you know, within the intercostal space, right? So, you know, I just line it up with the ribs so I can have a very, very good, uh, you know, long view of the spleen. And I will actually access anterior rather than posterior. So kind of on top of my probe rather than underneath my probe. Uh, and so it looks like a relatively severe angle as I'm going in. Uh, but I found that that helps me uh, just with my working angles. And I haven't had any problems with access that way. And it's just for me a more comfortable way of ultrasounding. Um, but I think that it's equally as good uh, to do it the other way. The other reason why I tend to access on top of my probe is that as the you know the more anterior I am, the further away I'm going to be from the pleural uh, surface. Okay, uh, and so I'm trying to avoid crossing the pleura as much as possible. And so be before you even get though to accessing the spleen, 
is, is there anything that you do in the pre-procedural workup in terms of, are there any patients that are off limits um, from uh, uh, a coagulopathic standpoint or uh, lab values? So, you know, I, I looked at our data a couple of years ago. And so you know, the, we will treat someone uh, whose INR is above two uh, and we'll give plate lifts if they're less than 30. Uh, but, you know, I will say that, you know, we, we have had one small hematoma out of the last, I think it was like 47 cases we did. And it was a guy whose INR was three uh, and his fibrinogen was sub hundred and his platelets were like 26 and we you know, gave him product, but uh, he had a small hematoma afterward that didn't require transfusion, but uh, you know, he had enough pain where we ended up getting a CT and he had a small hematoma, but didn't require treatment. So I think that is, you know, part of it is how you close uh, yeah, more yeah. so we'll than talk about that. Um, anything else. All right. So basically, just to recap that, if you have patients with an INR less than two or platelets above 30, splenic access is fair game without blood product, right? That Yeah, that's my feeling on it. Okay. And so once you have the patient, it, just to recap, you said you, you hope for a larger size spleen to where you can access, I assume like lower to mid pole where you're uh, beneath the costal margin. So you're trying to avoid a, a transpleural uh, access. Um, more anterior is more comfortable. Um, and is there anything specific um, in terms of like vein selection? Because sometimes if you access a splenic vein, I feel like you could end up in like a very tortuous vessel. Like, I mean, I would imagine like depending on what you're trying to accomplish, a straighter access to like the portal venous system is going to be advantageous. And so I don't know how much like correlate, like how much vein picking you do based on your uh, cross-sectional. So the, you know, a lot of times I'll want to make sure that I'm not in a vein that's going to some splenorenal shunt or that is, you know, previously thrombosed. So that, that is where the cross-sectional will help. I think the second thing that I do is that I'm looking to make sure that I have a decent parenchymal tract between where I enter the capsule of the spleen and where I get to the vein. Now, I tend to want to hit the splenic vein branch pretty close to the high, you know, to the hilum where it comes in. And so that tends to give you a decently long track. But there is sometimes when you're at the kind of extreme lower pole of the spleen, where it'll only be like a one and a half or a two centimeter track from the capsule to uh, kind of that more central vein. And in those instances, I will tend to actually look for a, a little bit uh, longer tract or a different vein where I can have a longer tract. And that is mainly for my comfort and closure okay. um, because I feel like if I have a longer splenic tract, while I could be crossing more things, it also gives me more comfort that I can lay down anything I want to lay down from the access point to the capsule and, you know, and make sure that I can get, you know, a, a nice closure that way. Uh, whereas if I have a very, very short tract, I feel like the, the distance uh, allows a little bit of an easier time for the blood to get out and cause a problem. Okay. I think that's a, a maybe a little bit counterintuitive to some uh, operators in that, you know, you think about accessing a more peripheral branch, like you might with, uh, I don't know, like nephrostomy kind of comes to mind, like, you know, more peripheral calyx. Um, all right. So uh, longer, longer parenchymal track gives you more option or more ability to close that track as you're coming out. A lot of people will describe like there's like a, a tactile uh, feel to accessing like a splenic vein. Can you talk a little bit or speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so you know, the one of the the I guess tricks that I picked up over time is that when I'm doing the splenic access, there is an absolute, very 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 subtle pop that you feel when you get into the vein. But I think more importantly, whether or not you feel the pop is what you do next. And the kind of general way we're taught when we're getting you know, biliary access or portal access is you go, you feel the pop, and then you puff back. And the problem with the the way that the splenic anatomy works is that, you know, it's just this kind of mush of kind of tracks rather than very, very well-defined vessels. And so anywhere that you puff within the spleen, you're going to fill 
the nearest vessel, and it's going to trick you into thinking you're actually in. And so what you've done at this point, you've gotten access, you think you're in, you puff, now you're injecting microscopic amounts of air, or and in doing so, you're kind of ruining your access if you're not perfect. And it's very, very hard to tell fluoroscopically if your wire is actually in, because it will dissect through the splenic parenchyma very, very easily. Uh, and because the spleen is a relatively rounded organ, you can be beyond what you think is the capsule, but actually just be very, very posterior within the spleen as it kind of extends beyond. So you know, you, you lose that anterior posterior visualization when you're just kind of trying to pass your wire under fluoroscopic and contrast access. So I've actually dispensed with using contrast when I access the spleen. And what I do is once I feel the pop and I'm in under ultrasound, I get my own eight wire and I visualize the wire within the main body of that splenic vein all the way to the hilum so that I am 100% certain that I'm in a vein. And if I'm not in and I watch my wire go into the parenchyma, you can back out your needle and adjust your needle and you haven't changed your ability to visualize it because you haven't let in a large amount of air that you're going to have when you're injecting contrast. And so you can do two or three adjustments or four adjustments within the vein and actually not lose the visualization. Once the tip of that wire, the first you know, two or three centimeters is definitively in the vein, then I switch to fluoroscopy, send it out a little bit. And at that point, you know, I haven't confirmed with contrast that I'm in. So I'll take the inner of my acoustic or transition set and I'll take that over and then I'll puff through the inner, prove that I'm in the vein and then go out and reassemble. And that has saved me just, you know, what used to take 45 minutes to an hour sometimes if I was really having a lot of trouble and, you know, multiple attempts at different veins. You know, now we get into the vein we want we get in relatively quickly and it, with a real minimum amount of fluoroscopic time, you know, with, you know, because you're only using fluoroscopy once you're definitively in, you know, you're going to have almost no fluoroscopic time uh, getting splenic access. Um, and so it's a lot of ultrasound time sometimes. So that also seems a little bit tricky, though, to be able to hold the probe. And, and I guess usually when I'm getting access to things, I'll, I'll usually have a hand on the needle, like resting against the patient, and then also kind of probing with the wire. So this is a situation where you've accessed, you kind of turn the um, the needle loose, and you're just kind of gently probing um, uh, with one hand on the wire and one hand on the ultrasound probe? That's exactly right. So I'll okay. have, you know, I'll, I'll be in, I'll be, you know, take the inner, style it out. I'll you know, put my wire down, I'll get tip to tip. And then I'll, I'll kind of gently probe with the wire. And, you know, I'll hold the needle, you know, with a couple of fingers and I'll hold the wire with a couple of fingers. And if I, you know, feel like I need to pull the needle back a little bit, I can do that real time under ultrasound with one hand while I'm probing with the wire. But I feel like the the confidence that I have in my access goes up exponentially with watching the wire go in. Okay. Uh, and, you know, that the number of times I've been tricked by the contrast puff and then just probing, probing and probing and probing uh, and then just destroying my visualization got me to the point where I was like, you know, I, I can't inject contrast here anymore until I'm 1000% certain that I'm in. Um, and then all of a sudden I stop hitting crazy veins that I don't want to be using. I pick the vein and I access that vein. And so uh, it's been wonderful because now I'm like, oh, you know, we'll just access the spleen. And then the next, you know, thing you kind of need to worry about is a little what size sheath or what size access you're going to use. Yeah. Um, oh, but before you, if I can before get you, away, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I just saying before you get to that, one of the things I wanted to drill down on for the audience is that once you have, I guess your 01, uh, your 018 wire in, you don't, you're not pot committed by going straight in with the AccuStick. You're using the inner to the AccuStick that's what you're going in with, then doing your contrast run, confirming that you're in, and then you're converting to the the 035 system. That is correct. Yeah. And then one and then once you're in, um, or once you choose a wire, I, I'm assuming you're glide wire a majority of the time. So I'll use uh so once I'm in and I'm comfortable that, you know, I've converted to my O3, I'm converting to my O three five system. Um uh, it is a, you know, it's a 
four French sheath, right? It's, it's or a you know six outer, and so I'll put a, a four French glide cath with an advantage wire through uh, my AccuStick set, and I'll go down, get into the superior mesenteric vein usually, uh, and then I will switch out for an Amplatz wire, and then I will put in almost universally. I will always want to put in my sheath over an Amplatz wire just because I want to make sure I have plenty of stiffness uh, and I don't want to kind of you know, mess with things. So I, I tend to be very conservative with dilating up the spleen and putting in sheaths. Um, and so I will, you know, eventually always convert to an Amplatz before I do anything. Okay. And then so over the Amplatz, you're going five French sheath. Um, any particular length? Like, um, I'm assuming it's not a short sheath. Like, do you go like a... 25 centimeter bright tip or 35 cm? So uh, good question. So if I can, I will, if this is something where I'm not entirely certain I need splenic access, I will use the four French glide cath and the uh, advantage wire just through the AccuSticks that, and I'll put a check flow valve on the back of it. Uh, so on occasion I can, I'll just leave it there because a, uh, you can get a 10 millimeter snare through the, the AccuStick set and through a four French glide cath. So you can, you know, if you have, if you can get a four French glide cath into the portal vein, you can get a 10 millimeter snare up. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes when I'm pretty confident with what I'm doing, I'll just leave it with that. Uh, if I feel like I have work to do, uh, whether ballooning or anything like that, I tend to use a Ansel one uh, and I'll use a five or a six or a seven Ansel one. And the reason why, you know, a lot of that will either be determined uh, by the size of the balloon I want to use um, or the size snare that I want to use uh, or any other devices. So I, you know, the largest sheet that I've put in is an eight French sheath uh, because I wanted to use Androjet through the spleen. Um, okay. Uh, but, but most of the time I'll use a six French uh, sheath and that's mainly because it's for balloon purposes. Um, and if I'm using certain plugs, I'll go up to seven. Uh, but I like the Ansel one because typically if I'm having to do work recanalizing the portal vein, I want uh, that nice curve of the Ansel uh, to, to be able to aid me in really seating myself on that thrombosed portal area while I'm kind of digging at it with a wire. Okay, I get that. So... Over the Amplatz, typically six for inch sheath. You've gone up to eights, and that's mainly based on you know whatever you're gonna whatever tools you're gonna be using. But bare minimum, you use the AccuStick set through which you can place like a four French angle tapered glide cath, and through that you can get the ten millimeter snare. Like if you're just doing like a flossing technique for a portal vein recan. Um, all right, so you've got splenic access, you got the appropriate sheath in, and let's just. Ta say that we're talking about like a portal vein uh, recanalization. What are your next steps in terms of accessing the native portal vein or the thrombosed section of the portal vein and how you kind of probe that area and get in a position to where you can um, then uh, do a well, I'll, I'll, well, then we'll kind of switch gears and talk about the gun sight technique. Okay. So, you know, there, there are two things is almost invariably there is the teeniest, tiniest little sliver of a portal something left. Um, and when I go in, I will do a really good solid run from that kind of confluence of the splenic and superior mesenteric vein. And invariably, you're going to have a very large coronary vein varix uh, that's going to be stealing a lot of the contrast. But oftentimes, you will see just the teeniest sliver of a... Um, portal vein remnant that's left. And the way that you know that it's the true portal vein remnant, it tends to be unusually linear compared to everything else. So you'll have all these other squiggly uh, vessels that are kind of going all over the place. And then you'll just see a diagonal straight line going up toward the hilum. And that is going to be uh, almost invariably uh, your true portal. If you do not see that, almost invariably, there will be the slightest indentation or nipple uh, that shows where you need to go. And in that's the instance in which having the Ansel sheath is very helpful because it allows you to kind of torque that sheath and jam it right, right onto that nipple. And then 
you know, I've used, uh, I tend to want to use a little bit of a stiffer catheter. So I'll usually jump up to a uh, five French uh, Comfy uh, to really probe that has a little bit more stiffness uh, rather than using a four French glide cath. And then any wire, I tend to like the advantage wire, but I've used the Roadrunner wire, glide wire. Um, and once you get in and you feel like your wire is kind of taking it then I kind of tend to want to follow pretty quickly with my catheter. And then once my catheter is kind of jammed into the clot, I tend to want to give a pretty good puff because once you get past that first little bit, sometimes you'll be able to really see things that you just couldn't see. Uh, and even though you're kind of in travisating contrast along clot, it'll give you a little bit of a roadmap. And I've, I felt like that that's been a very helpful um, tool. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, you know, sometimes it can take 20 or 30 minutes of just digging at the clot uh, with the front end, the back end of a wire before all of a sudden not really knowing what you did differently and seeing your wire go a centimeter more than it did, you know, 20 minutes ago. Sure. Uh, but being a little, little perseverant uh, there is good. And then to be fair, like if you don't use any fluoroscopic time on your splenic access, you have a little bit more there. Um, and the other thing is, is that if I'm recanning a spleen, I will not get jugular access until I've recanned the portal vein. Okay. Um, you That's know, if, if I know, you know, like I'm just not going to waste that time. Um, and I used to get everything set up and get ready to make some throws. And now it's like, well, I'm not going to make a, a jugular wound uh, unless I know that the, the portal vein is at least accessed uh, from the other direction. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, trying to maximize the amount of time you have to do that, I think, is key. And I, I'll bring the pulse rate down to four pulses uh, per second. Um, anything I can do, because, you know, sometimes it'll take, you know, a couple hours and you don't necessarily want to burn up the radiation that you have to to get things done uh, just accessing the portal. Beam. Right. And is it similar to uh, like crossing a CTO in the leg in that, you know, as soon as you see your wire buckle upon itself, you can take that loop and kind of push forward. It, I mean, I imagine it's kind of tedious work like this and that it's just like part feel, part experience. And sometimes you just have to know like when it feels right to, to take it. That's exactly right. Yeah. If you see that wire buckle and go, it's lovely. And, uh, you know, more and more, I will attempt to cross uh, thrombose splenic veins as well. Uh, and so, you know, particularly if I've accessed the spleen and I'm able to get that folded over, um, yeah, you'll you'll get that feel and then you know you've kind of won the game opening up the splenic vein and then, you know, you can get it to fold over sometimes and it'll go and, you know, then you're you're thrilled, right? You know you're in the the true the true portal and, you know, you don't need to get very far because if your wire is going even a little bit, then that means you're in the clot. Uh, okay. And it's just a matter of getting your catheter to follow. All right, guys, that will conclude part three of our tips podcast. Stay tuned for the fourth and final edition. 